Johann Reichardt may not be a familiar name to you, but rest assured that his name once struck terror into those who heard it, and his face was the last thing thousands of people saw in this world. We are talking about the most efficient executioner employed by the Third Reich to carry out politically and sinisterly dictated capital punishments. In this video, we will tell you about his origins, his work during Nazism, and how he ended up switching sides to the Allies after the end of World War II. Get ready to learn about this fascinating and dark character from Nazi Germany. Welcome once again to Military History. Let's begin. Johann Reichardt was born in Wittenbach, a small village in Bavaria in 1893, into a family with eight generations of executioners. In World War I, he served in the trenches of Verdun, so he had already been exposed to all the imaginable cruelty and death before continuing the family profession. In peacetime, he chose a profession away from war, but not from blood, becoming a butcher while awaiting the job he was truly destined for. His uncle Franz had been a state executioner for many years until he retired, passing the position to his beloved and sinister nephew, who applied for the position as soon as he returned to Munich. In April 1924, he was officially appointed as the state executioner of Bavaria, and once accepted, he devoted himself wholeheartedly to his new job as a true professional. Johann Reichardt had the ambition to become the best executioner in Germany and was confident in being a master of his trade. No one would ever be able to kill as quickly as him. Reichardt considered execution an art for which he had the right qualifications. Keep in mind that the guillotine sentence is one of the darkest and the material we are about to see, recorded as a piece of German expressionism, conveys the feeling that so stimulated Reichardt. The government promised him 150 gold marks for each execution. And in the official bulletin, his appointment was announced with the following text. From April 1st, 1924, Reichardt is responsible for the execution of all death penalties in the free state of Bavaria, executed by decapitation with a guillotine. The career of the executioner Johann Reichardt began on July 4, 1924, when he beheaded Rupert Fischer and Andreas Hutterer, who had been sentenced to death for committing murder. Until then, he had only practiced with dummies and a corpse, but he had proven to be cold and efficient. On that distant July 4th, the rehearsals were over and the execution was real. Reichardt placed Fischer exactly under the guillotine blade hanging two and a half meters above him. He released the locking lever and the blade fell, cutting off Fischer's head, which rolled into a basket as Reichardt uttered the words he would repeat over and over in the years he was active as an executioner. The verdict is executed. Clearly, the executioner took his occupation very seriously, to the point of sending chills down the spines of his own colleagues, who remembered him in his uniform, impeccably dressed in the old-fashioned way of his profession. Black suit, white shirt, black bow tie, white gloves, and a top hat. Those who spent time with him described him as extremely strict. He always had a notebook where he recorded everything with precision, trying not to miss any detail and perfecting his task. In the mid-1920s, as the Weimar Republic adopted some more humanistic policies, there was a decrease in death penalties. This generated a pause in executions and forced Reichardt to rethink his future in that profession, which was not allowing him to cover his daily life expenses. A series of life sentences and pardons in the late 1920s led him to write a formal resignation to his superiors. My last execution took place in Kempton on January 20th, 1928. Since all murderers sentenced to death have been pardoned, 
I feel very hindered in my tasks and business trips, as I earn not a penny for weeks. That year, he left the position of executioner in Bavaria and went to the Netherlands where he became a fruit and vegetable seller. However, the political climate in Germany was about to change, making Reichardt's profession highly sought after again. Once Hitler became chancellor in January 1933, the Bavarian executioner returned to his homeland, hoping to make up for lost time in his cherished task. He joined various Nazi organizations, such as the party's motorized corps, but did not officially become a party member until 1937. Shortly after his return, Reichardt became a vital element in the well-oiled killing machinery of the Nazi state, carrying out thousands of executions. The Third Reich punished even the smallest offenses in this brutal way, as recounted by the following historian. Sie sind also Menschen umgebracht worden, weil sie einen Artikel im Wert von 50 Pfennig gestohlen haben beispielsweise. Oder Personen, die ähm, ähm, sexuelle Beziehungen zu Juden unterhalten haben. Da wurden dann Juden umgebracht und man hat sehr, sehr viele äh, Zwangsarbeiter damals umgebracht. Bei denen gab es eine Todesstrafe schon im Fall, wenn, man, wenn die Leute zwei, drei Hühner geklaut hatten. Criminals, resistance fighters and dissidents constituted the majority of Reichardt's victims, whose lives he ended with a simple drop of his guillotine. On his bloodiest day, he executed 32 people with cold efficiency, forever earning the nickname Headhunter. Among his most renowned victims was Sophie Schall, a university student whose crime was being a prominent member of the anti-Nazi White Rose movement which had peacefully resisted the regime by writing pamphlets against Hitler and his tyrannical government, distributing them among university students in Munich and the civilian population. Sophie was the first of her group to be sentenced to death, a sentence that took place just three hours after being declared guilty by Judge Roland Freisler and his People's Court, famous for being a rabid Nazi extremist. The event was truly chilling. The young woman walked impassively towards the shadow of the guillotine that would end her life. It was 5 p.m. on February 22, 1943, and it was already getting dark outside. In the execution chamber of Munich's Stadelheim prison, Sophie Schull would pay with her short life, at just 21 years old, for distributing pamphlets denouncing Adolf Hitler. Her last words at the execution were as noble and altruistic as her activism against the Third Reich. It is such a beautiful and sunny day, and I have to leave, but what does my death matter if through it thousands of people wake up and mobilize to action? Then the sharp blade of the guillotine fell on her young neck. Below we can see a recreation from one of the many films based on the inspiring and tragic story of Scholl. The beheadings of Sophie Scholl, her brother Hans, and a third member of the White Rose were among the 2,873 executions that Reichardt carried out during World War II. For dedicated, professional, and insensitive executioners like him, the rise of the guillotine in Nazi times made them rich. Those who dropped the blade received 3,000 marks per year and a bonus of 65 marks for each execution. Given his expertise and sinister dedication, Reichardt earned enough to buy a villa in a prosperous suburb of Munich. His zeal for killing knew no bounds. He was so determined to be punctual in all his appointments that he asked the Ministry of Transportation if they could save him from speeding fines. Although his request was denied, this action alone demonstrated his obsession with his work. In 1943, he performed 764 beheadings, being one of the three most employed executioners in the Third Reich. His domains were southern Germany, Austria, and the Bohemian region in the Czech Republic. 
his main working tool, his fallbeel, which literally means falling axe, Aimeweiss accompanied him. It was essentially a German variant of the French guillotine. Reichardt's portable fallbeel had some modifications that made it more effective and ominous, as seen below. The executioner even invented a device called double detective clamps that kept prisoners immobilized without the need for tying them with a rope. The metal clamp held the prisoner under the guillotine instead of a rope, reducing the execution time to just four seconds. He had also slightly modified the weight of the blade so that it would fall and cut the victim's head in just three quarters of a second. Executioners, and especially the headhunter, had plenty of experience to know that the straps were a completely unnecessary accessory, as the mere sight of the machine usually left victims so scared that they willingly went to the scale like docile lambs. The problem arose when too much time passed and the victim's stupor wore off. This led to the absolute terror in the condemned, who, realizing what awaited them, desperately tried to escape creating situations that even the executioners and their assistants found very unpleasant. After the failed assassination attempt on Hitler in 1944, the Nazis' thirst for blood increased. Reichardt was ordered to travel to Berlin while the officers and intellectuals involved in Operation Valkyrie, the plot to overthrow the Nazi state, were hunted down and extinguished. At this historical moment, the numbers of capital punishments in the Third Reich escalated to unprecedented levels. Traitors, defeatists, and even those who listened to the BBC on the radio ended up being victims of Reichardt. As if death were not enough, the Nazis had another punishment for the relatives of those executed by their government. The relatives of the victims were ordered to pay the cost of the executions. For each day, a prisoner remained detained before their death they were charged a fee of one white 50 marks. Then, there was the actual cost of the executions, which amounted to 300 marks. The Nazi state, in a cruel and inhumane manner, even demanded the return of the 12 pennies it cost to issue the bill. Finally, the bodies were placed in coffins shorter than usual to save wood and to make it clear that the corpse had no head. They were often sent to anatomy departments so that Nazi doctors could practice medicine or even more macabre experiments. It seemed that Reichardt's future was secure with the Third Reich, requesting his services daily to execute dissenters. However, by 1944, the war had taken a dramatic turn and Hitler was approaching defeat. When the Reich collapsed in 1945, new masters arrived to apprehend Europe's most efficient executioner. In May of that year, American soldiers arrested him, shouting, Nazi bastard. Interestingly, he was imprisoned in Landsberg prison, but was not tried for carrying out his duties as a judicial executioner. Reichardt had to justify himself before a denazification tribunal, where he declared the following. I have carried out death sentences with the firm conviction that I must serve the state with my work and comply with legally promulgated laws. I never doubted the legality of what I was doing. Despite the temptation to see him as unbalanced, the tribunal considered him a tool. He did not stay behind bars for long, as his unique skill made him a useful and interesting asset for the Allies. Shortly after being detained, Johann Reichardt switched sides. In the service of his new American commanders, he ended the lives of 156 low-ranking Nazi war criminals. The first to be executed were three German civilians, executed in November 1945 for killing downed American pilots. However, after innocent civilians were mistakenly executed in the Allied frenzy of killing Germans, Reichardt refused to carry out more killings on behalf of the Allies. This shows that even this monster had certain principles.
For refusing to continue collaborating with the winning side, Reichardt was imprisoned and sentenced to two years in a labor camp and the confiscation of half of his assets in 1947. The executioner was married and had three children, and he was recognized in German society as one of the Reich's executioners. Hans, one of his sons, committed suicide in 1950 due to the stigma he carried because of his father's profession. The brothers sadly remembered the taunts of other children in school who shouted at him, head cutter, head cutter, your father is a head cutter. Reichardt spent the rest of his days in isolation, raising dogs and making perfumes, and finally living in a nursing home near Munich. He died after many years of living in solitude in 1972. Despite pretending to fade into obscurity, his story emerges again in truly extraordinary ways. Sie soll nach dem Krieg in der Donau versenkt worden sein, hieß es. Doch jetzt wurde sie wiedergefunden im Depot des Bayerischen Nationalmuseums. Die Guillotine aus der NS-Zeit. Das Mordinstrument, mit dem höchstwahrscheinlich auch die Geschwister Scholl sowie tausende andere Menschen getötet wurden. The bloodstained guillotine, used by the infamous executioner to kill thousands of people in Nazi Germany, had been thrown into the Danube River to eliminate evidence of its existence. However, it surfaced and was rescued by a civilian in the 21st century. The man who discovered it believed that the gruesome relic should be displayed publicly. However, at that time, the regional government of Bavaria concluded that it should be kept out of public view in case it offended the families of the victims and attracted macabre attention. Despite this, relatives of the victims believe otherwise, as explicitly stated in this testimony from a fellow member of the White Rose Group, Sophie Scholl. Germany's chief executioner claimed the lives of about 3,165 people, the vast majority during World War II. This grim character remains just a symptom of the violent and inhumane actions of the Third Reich. Unlike many fanatical followers, Johann Reichardt considered himself merely a worker who had a cold and professional relationship with death. He believed that his occupation was an art and wanted to be the most efficient and fast at carrying it out. According to the data, he seems to have achieved his sinister goal. Thus, we reach the end of the video today. Leave your opinions in the comments below. We appreciate you for sticking around until the end and look forward to seeing you in the upcoming installments of Military History.